Part three, chapter five of the speaking voice principles of training simplified and condensed by Catherine Jewell Everts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five, didactic poetry. If our study of didactic prose and lyric poetry has been faithful, we shall have learned to think more vividly and to feel more intelligently we shall also find that our speech has gained precision and that our tone has gained purity and power i shall ask you to test your own increase in power along any of these lines by a self-directed study of didactic poetry i give you the didactic poem because it makes a double appeal through its form to emotion through its aim to the mind i have given you examples of this form in which the beauty and fascination of metre rhythm and rhyme and the didactic nature of the thought do not seem to overbalance each other if either one should predominate you must by your interpretation strike the balance in reading robert browning's rabbi ben ezra from which i shall quote but a few verses you must carry to your auditor the full import of the philosophy, but in doing so you must not lose the beauty of the verse in which the poet has set it. Rabbi Ben Ezra 1. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hand, who saith, a whole i planned youth shows but half trust god see all nor be afraid two not that amassing flowers youth sighed which rose makes ours which lily leave and then as best recall not that admiring stars it yearned nor jove nor mars mine be some figured flame which blends transcends them all three not for such hopes and fears annulling youth's brief years do i remonstrate folly wide the mark rather i prize the doubt low kinds exist without finished and finite clods untroubled by a spark six then welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough each sting that bids nor sit nor stand but go be our joys three parts pain strive and hold cheap the strain learn nor account the pang dare never grudge the throw seven for thence a paradox which comforts while it mocks shall life succeed in that it seems to fail what i aspired to be and was not comforts me a brute i might have been but would not sink in the scale twenty two now who shall arbitrate ten men love what i hate shun what i follow slight what i receive ten who in ears and eyes match me we all surmise they this thing and i that whom shall my soul believe twenty three not on the vulgar mass called work must sentence pass things done that took the eye and had the price o'er which from level stand the low world laid its hand found straightway to its mind could value in a trice twenty four but all the world's coarse thumb and finger failed to plumb so passed in making up the main account all instincts immature all purposes unsure that weighed not as his work yet swelled the man's amount twenty five thoughts hardly to be packed into a narrow act 
fancies that broke through language and escaped all i could never be all men ignored in me this i was worth to god whose wheel the picture shaped robert browning forbearance hast thou named all the birds without a gun loved the wood-rose and left it on its stalk at rich men's tables eaten bread and pulse unarmed faced danger with a heart of trust and loved so well a high behaviour in man or maid that thou from speech refrained nobility more nobly to repay o oh, be my friend and teach me to be thine each and all little thinks in the field yon red-cloaked clown of thee from the hilltop looking down the heifer that lows in the upland farm far heard lows not thine ear to charm the sexton tolling his bell at noon deems not that great napoleon stops his horse and lists with delight whilst his files sweep round yon alpine height nor knowest thou what argument thy life to thy neighbour's creed has lent all are needed by each one nothing is fair or good alone i thought the sparrow's note from heaven singing at dawn on the alder bough i brought him home in his nest at even he sings the song but it cheers not now for i did not bring home the river and sky he sang to my ear they sang to my eye the delicate shells lay on the shore the bubbles of the latest wave fresh pearls to their enamel gave and the bellowing of the savage sea greeted their safe escape to me i wiped away the weeds and foam i fetched my sea-born treasures home but the poor unsightly noisome things had left their beauty on the shore with the sun and the sand and the wild uproar the lover watched his graceful maid as mid the virgin train she strayed nor knew her beauty's best attire was woven still by the snow-white choir at last she came to his hermitage like the bird from the woodlands to the cage the gay enchantment was undone a gentle wife but fairy none then i said i covet truth beauty is unripe childhood's cheat i leave it behind with the games of youth as i spoke beneath my feet the ground pine curled its pretty wreath running over the club moss burrs i inhaled the violet's breath around me stood the oaks and firs pine cones and acorns lay on the ground over me soared the eternal sky full of light and of deity again i saw again i heard the rolling river the morning bird beauty through my senses stole i yielded myself to the perfect whole r w emerson end of chapter 5three chapter six of the speaking voice principles of training simplified and condensed by katherine jewell everts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the short story in your work on the short story i want you to study two distinctive types the story which depends for its interest on incident and the story which depends for its interest on character development 
I want you to study side by side with this story of Mary E. Wilkins, one of Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Tales. Ricky Ticky Tavy is a good example of the story of incident. The revolt of mother is a good example of the story of character development. Both these tales obey the highest laws of the short story, and both demand of the reader sustained vigour of the imagination and spirit, and so of tone and expression. Both stories are simple in structure and in language. The interest of Mrs. Freeman's story lies in the characters, and depends for its quality of movement upon the increasing vitality of the relation between the characters. Interest in Mr. Kipling's story is one of incident. It is more difficult to catch and hold the attention of an audience with the New England story than with the Jungle Tale, because its interest is more subtle and its movement less pronounced. The reader of Mrs. Freeman's story must understand the type of character she has presented, and be able to feel and suggest the individual atmosphere of each character. The reader of Ricky Ticky Tavy must be obsessed with the brave spirit of the little mongoose, and suggest his atmosphere of courage and unflinching purpose. Mrs. Freeman's story must move in the interpretation with the movement of the characters in relation to one another and in relation to the underlying philosophy of the situation. Mr. Kipling's story moves along a path of progressive dramatic incident to an intense climax. Reader's Note The author presents in brackets certain elements of the narrative portions of the text which may be omitted in presenting the story from the platform. I have read it all as written. End of Reader's Note From A New England Nun and Other Stories Copyright 1891 by Harper and Brothers The Revolt of Mother by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Father? What is it? What are them men digging over there in the field for? There was a sudden dropping and enlarging of the lower part of the old man's face, as if some heavy weight had settled therein. He shut his mouth tight and went on harnessing the great bay mare. He hustled the collar onto her neck with a jerk. Father! The old man slapped the saddle upon the mare's back. Look here, father. I want to know what them men are digging over in the field for, and I'm going to know. I wish you'd go into the house, mother, and tend to your own affairs, the old man said then. He ran his words together, and his speech was almost as inarticulate as a growl. But the woman understood. It was her most native tongue. "'I ain't going into the house till you tell me what them men are doing over there in the field,' said she. Then she stood waiting. She was a small woman, short and straight-waisted like a child in her brown cotton gown. Her forehead was mild and benevolent between the smooth curves of grey hair. There were meek downward lines about her nose and mouth, but her eyes, fixed upon the old man, looked as if the meekness had been the result of her own will, never of the will of another. They were in the barn, standing before the wide-open doors. The spring air, full of the smell of growing grass and unseen blossoms, came in their faces. The deep yard in front was littered with farm wagons and piles of wood. On the edges, close to the fence and the house, the grass was a vivid green, and there were some dandelions. The old man glanced doggedly at his wife as he tightened the last buckles on the harness. She looked as immovable to him as one of the rocks in his pasture-land, bound to the earth with generations of blackberry vines. He slapped the reins over the horse and started forth from the barn. "'Father!' said she. The old man pulled up. "'What is it?' "'I want to know what them men are digging over there in that field for.' "'They're digging a cellar, I suppose, if you've got to know.' A cellar for what? A barn. A barn? 
you ain't going to build a barn over there where we was going to have a house father the old man said not another word he hurried the horse into the farm wagon and clattered out of the yard jouncing as sturdily on his seat as a boy the woman stood a moment looking after him then she went out of the barn across a corner of the yard to the house the house standing at right angles with the great barn and a long reach of sheds and outbuildings was infinitesimal compared with them it was scarcely as commodious for people as the little boxes under the barn eaves were for the doves a pretty girl's face pink and delicate as a flower was looking out of one of the house windows she was watching three men who were digging over in the field which bounded the yard near the road line she turned quietly when the woman entered what are they digging for mother said she did he tell you they're digging for a cellar for a new barn oh mother he ain't going to build another barn that's what he says a boy stood before the kitchen glass combing his hair he combed slowly and painstakingly arranging his brown hair in a smooth hillock over his forehead he did not seem to pay any attention to the conversation sammy did you know father was going to build a new barn asked the girl the boy combed assiduously sammy he turned and showed a face like his father's under his smooth crest of hair yes i suppose i did he said reluctantly how long have you known it asked his mother about three months i guess why didn't you tell of it didn't think twould do no good i don't see what father wants another barn for said the girl in her sweet slow voice she turned again to the window and stared out at the digging men in the field. Her tender, sweet face was full of a gentle distress. Her forehead was as bald and innocent as a baby's, with the light hair strained back from it in a row of curl papers. She was quite large, but her soft curves did not look as if they covered muscles. Her mother looked sternly at the boy. "'Is he going to buy more cows?' said she the boy did not reply he was tying his shoes sammy i want you to tell me if he's going to buy more cows i suppose he is how many four i guess his mother said nothing more she went into the pantry and there was a clatter of dishes the boy got his cap from a nail behind the door took an old arithmetic from the shelf and started for school he was lightly built but clumsy he went out of the yard with a curious spring in the hips that made his loose home-made jacket tilt up in the rear the girl went to the sink and began to wash the dishes that were piled up there her mother came promptly out of the pantry and shoved her aside you wipe em she said i'll wash there's a good many this morning the mother plunged her hands vigorously into the water the girl wiped the plate slowly and dreamily. Mother, said she, don't you think it's too bad father's going to build that new barn, much as we need a decent house to live in? Her mother scrubbed a dish fiercely. You ain't found out yet we're women folks, Nanny Pen, said she. You ain't seen enough of men folks yet to. One of these days you'll find it out and then you'll know that we know only what men folks think we do so far as any use of it goes and how we'd ought to reckon men folks in with providence and not complain of what they do any more than we do of the weather i don't care i don't believe george is anything like that anyhow said nanny her delicate face flushed pink her lips pouted softly as if she were going to cry you wait and see i guess george eastman ain't no better than other men you hadn't ought to judge father though he can't help it cos he don't look at things just the way we do and we've been pretty comfortable here after all the roof don't leak ain't never but once that's one thing father's kept it shingled right up i do wish we had a parlour 
I guess it won't hurt George Eastman any to come to see you in a nice clean kitchen. I guess a good many girls don't have as good a place as this. Nobody's ever heard me complain. I ain't complained either, mother. Well, I don't think you'd better. A good father and a good home as you've got. Suppose your father made you go out and work for your living. Lots of girls have too that ain't no stronger and better able to than you be. Sarah Penn washed the frying pan with a conclusive air. She scrubbed the outside of it as faithfully as the inside. She was a masterly keeper of her box of a house. Her one living room never seemed to have in it any of the dust which the friction of life with inanimate matter produces. She swept, and there seemed to be no dirt to go before the broom. She cleaned, and one could see no difference. She was like an artist so perfect that he has apparently no art. Today she got out a mixing bowl and a board and rolled some pies, and there was no more flour upon her than upon her daughter who was doing finer work. Nanny was to be married in the fall, and she was sewing on some white cambric and embroidery. She sewed industriously while her mother cooked. Her soft, milk-white hands and wrists showed whiter than her delicate work. "'We must have the stove moved out in the shed before long,' said Mrs. Penn. "'Talk about not having things. It's been a real blessing to be able to put a stove up in that shed in hot weather. Father did one good thing when he fixed that stove-pipe out there.' Sarah Penn's face, as she rolled her pies, had that expression of meek vigour which might have characterised one of the New Testament saints. She was making mince pies. Her husband, Adoniram Penn, liked them better than any other kind. She baked twice a week. Adoniram often liked a piece of pie between meals. She hurried this morning. It had been later than usual when she began, and she wanted to have a pie baked for dinner. However deep a resentment she might be forced to hold against her husband, she would never fail in sedulous attention to his wants. Nobility of character manifests itself at loopholes when it is not provided with large doors. Sarah Penn's showed itself today in flaky dishes of pastry. She made the pies faithfully, while across the table she could see, when she glanced up from her work, the sight that rankled in her patient and steadfast soul, the digging of the cellar of the new barn in the place where Adoniram forty years ago had promised her their new house should stand. The pies were done for dinner. Adoniram and Sammy were home a few minutes after twelve o'clock. The dinner was eaten with serious haste. There was never much conversation at the table in the Penn family. Adoniram asked a blessing, and they ate promptly, then rose up and went about their work. Sammy went back to school, taking soft, sly lopes out of the yard like a rabbit. He wanted a game of marbles before school, and feared his father would give him some chores to do. Adoniram hastened to the door and called after him, but he was out of sight. "'I don't see what you let him go for, mother,' said he. I wanted him to help me unload that wood. Adoniram went to work out in the yard unloading wood from the wagon. Sarah put away the dinner dishes while Nanny took down her curl papers and changed her dress. She was going down to the store to buy some more embroidery and thread. When Nanny was gone, Mrs. Penn went to the door. Father, she called. Well, what is it? I want to see you just a minute, father. I can't leave this wood no how. I've got to get it unloaded and go for a load of gravel at four two o'clock. Sammy had ought to help me. You hadn't ought to let him go to school so early. I want to see you just a minute. I tell you, I can't no how, mother. Father, you come here. Sarah Penn stood in the door like a queen. She held her head as if it bore a crown. There was that patience which makes authority royal in her voice. Adoniram went. Mrs. Penn led the way into the kitchen and pointed to a chair. "'Sit down, father,' said she. "'I've got something I want to say to you.' 
he sat down heavily his face was quite stolid but he looked at her with restive eyes well what is it mother i want to know what you're building that new barn for father i ain't got nothing to say about it it can't be you think you need another barn i tell you i ain't got nothing to say about it mother and i ain't gonna say nothing be you going to buy more cows adoniram did not reply he shut his mouth tight i know you be as well as i want to now father look here sarah penn had not sat down she stood before her husband in the humble fashion of a scripture woman i'm going to talk real plain to you i never have since i married you but i'm going to now i ain't never complained and i ain't going to complain now but i'm going to talk plain you see this room here father you look at it well you see there ain't no carpet on the floor and you see the paper is all dirty and dropping off the walls we ain't had no new paper on it for ten year and then i put it on myself and it didn't cost but ninepence a roll you see this room father it's all the one i've had to work in and eat in and sit in since we was married there ain't another woman in the whole town whose husband ain't got half the means you have but what's got better it's all the room nanny's got to have her company in and there ain't one of her mates but what's got better and their father's not so able as hers is it's all the room she'll have to be married in what would you have thought father if we had had our wedding in a room no better than this i was married in my mother's parlour with a carpet on the floor and stuffed furniture and a mahogany card table and this is all the room my daughter will have to be married in look here father sarah penn went across the room as though it were a tragic stage she flung open a door and disclosed a tiny bedroom only large enough for a bed and a bureau with a path between there father said she there's all the room i've had to sleep in forty year all my children were born there the two that died and the two that's living i was sick with a fever there she stepped to another door and opened it it led into the small ill-lighted pantry here said she is all the buttery i've got every place i've got for my dishes to set away my victuals in and to keep my milk pans in father i've been taking care of the milk of six cows in this place and now you're going to build a new barn and keep more cows and give me more to do in it she threw open another door a narrow crooked flight of stairs wound upward from it there father said she i want you to look at the stairs that go up to them two unfinished chambers that are all the places our son and daughter have had to sleep in all their lives there ain't a prettier girl in town nor a more ladylike one than nanny and that's the place she has to sleep in it ain't so good as your horse's stall it ain't so warm and tight sarah penn went back and stood before her husband now father said she i want to know if you think you're doing right and according to what you profess here when we was married forty year ago you promised me faithful that we should have a new house built in that lot over in the field before the year was out you said you had money enough and you wouldn't ask me to live in no such place as this it is forty year now and you've been making more money and i've been saving of it for you ever since and you ain't built no house yet you've built sheds and cowhouses and one new barn and now you're going to build another father i want to know if you think it's right you're lodging your dumb beasts better than you are your own flesh and blood i want to know if you think it's right i ain't got nothing to say you can't say nothing without owning it ain't right father and there's another thing i ain't complained i've got along forty year and i s'pose i should forty more if it want for the if we don't have another house nanny she can't live with us after she's married she'll have to go somewheres else to live away from us 
and it don't seem as if I could have it so no ways, father. She wa n t ever strong. She's got considerable colour, but there wa'n't never any backbone to her. I've always took the heft of everything off her, and she ain't fit to keep house and do everything herself. She'll be all worn out inside a year. Think of her doing all the washing and ironing and baking with them soft white hands and arms and sweeping. I can't have it so, no ways, father. Mrs. Penn's face was burning. Her mild eyes gleamed. She had pleaded her little cause like a Webster. She had ranged from severity to pathos. But her opponent employed that obstinate silence which makes eloquence futile with mocking echoes. Adoniram arose clumsily. Father, ain't you got nothing to say? said Mrs. Penn. I've got to go off after that load of gravel. I can't stand here talking all day. Father, won't you think it over and have a house built there instead of a barn? I ain't got nothing to say. Adoniram shuffled out. Mrs. Penn went into her bedroom. When she came out, her eyes were red. She had a roll of unbleached cotton cloth. She spread it out on the kitchen table and began cutting out some shirts for her husband. The men over in the field had a team to help them this afternoon. She could hear their halloos. She had a scanty pattern for the shirts. She had to plan and piece the sleeves. Nanny came home with her embroidery and sat down with her needlework. She had taken down her curl papers, and there was a soft roll of fair hair like an aureole over her forehead. Her face was as delicately fine and clear as porcelain. Suddenly she looked up. And the tender red flamed all over her face and neck. Mother, said she, what say? I've been thinking. I don't see how we're going to have any wedding in this room. I'd be ashamed to have his folks come if we didn't have anybody else. Maybe we can have some new paper before then. I can put it on. I guess you won't have no call to be ashamed of your belongings. We might have the wedding in the new barn, said Nanny with gentle pettishness. Why, mother, what makes you look so? Mrs. Penn had started and was staring at her with a curious expression. She turned again to her work and spread out a pattern carefully on the cloth. Nothing, said she. Presently, Adoniram clattered out of the yard in his two wheeled dump cart. Standing as proudly upright as a Roman charioteer. Mrs. Penn opened the door and stood there a minute, looking out. The halloos of the men sounded louder. It seemed to her all through the spring months that she heard nothing but the halloos and the noises of saws and hammers. The new barn grew fast. It was a fine edifice for this little village. Men came on pleasant Sundays in their meeting suits and clean shirt bosoms and stood around it admiringly. Mrs. Penn did not speak of it, and Adoniram did not mention it to her, although sometimes upon a return from inspecting it he bore himself with injured dignity. It's a strange thing how your mother feels about the new barn, he said confidentially to Sammy one day. Sammy only grunted after an odd fashion for a boy. He had learned it from his father. The barn was all completed, ready for use by the third week in July. Adoniram had planned to move his stock in on Wednesday. On Tuesday he received a letter which changed his plans. He came in with it early in the morning. Sammy's been to the post office, said he. And I've got a letter from Hiram. Hiram was Mrs. Penn's brother who lived in Vermont. Well, said Mrs. Penn, what does he say about the folks? I guess they're all right. He says he thinks if I come up country right off, there's a chance to buy just the kind of horse I want. 
he stared reflectively out of the window at the new barn. Mrs. Penn was making pies. She went on, clapping the rolling pin into the crust, although she was very pale, and her heart beat loudly. "'I don't know but what I'd better go,' said Adoniram. "'I hate to go off just now, right in the midst of haying. But the ten-acre lot's cut, and I guess Rufus and the others can get along without me three or four days. I can't get a horse round here to suit me no how, and I've got to have another for all that wood all in in the fall. I told Hiram to watch out, and if he got wind of a good horse to let me know, I guess I'd better go. I'll get out your clean shirt and collar, said Mrs. Penn calmly. She laid out Adoniram's Sunday suit and his clean clothes on the bed in the little bedroom. She got his shaving water and razor ready. At last she buttoned on his collar and fastened his black cravat. Adoniram never wore his collar and cravat except on extra occasions. He held his head high with a rasped dignity. When he was all ready with his coat and hat brushed and a lunch of pie and cheese in a paper bag, he hesitated on the threshold of the door. He looked at his wife, and his manner was defiantly apologetic. "'If them cows come to-day, Sammy can drive them into the new barn,' said he. "'And when they bring the hay up, they can pitch it in there.' "'Well,' replied Mrs. Penn. Adoniram set his shaven face ahead and started. When he had cleared the doorstep, he turned and looked back with a kind of nervous solemnity. "'I shall be back by Saturday, if nothing happens,' said he. "'Do be careful, father,' returned his wife. She stood in the door with Nanny at her elbow and watched him out of sight. Her eyes had a strange, doubtful expression in them. Her peaceful forehead was contracted. She went in and about her baking again. Nanny sat sewing. Her wedding day was drawing nearer, and she was getting pale and thin with her steady sewing. Her mother kept glancing at her. "'Have you got that pain in your side this morning?' she asked. "'A little.' Mrs. Penn's face, as she worked, changed. Her perplexed forehead smoothed, her eyes were steady, her lips firmly set. She formed a maxim for herself, although incoherently with her unlettered thoughts. Unsolicited opportunities are the guideposts of the law to the new roads of life, she repeated in effect, and she made up her mind to her course of action. Supposing I had wrote to Hiram, she muttered once when she was in the pantry. Supposing I had wrote and asked him if he knew of any horse— but I didn't, and father's going want none of my doing. It looks like a providence. Her voice rang out quite loud at the last. What are you talking about, mother? called Nanny. Nothing. Mrs. Penn hurried her baking. At eleven o'clock it was all done. The load of hay from the west field came slowly down the cart track and drew up at the new barn. Mrs. Penn ran out. Stop! she screamed. Stop! The men stopped and looked. Sammy upreared from the top of the load and stared at his mother. Stop! she cried out again. Don't you put the hay in that barn. Put it in the old one. Why, he said to put it in here, returned one of the haymakers wonderingly. He was a young man, a neighbour's son, whom Adoniram hired by the year to help on the farm. "'Don't you put the hay in the new barn? There's room enough in the old one, ain't there?' said Mrs. Penn. "'Room enough?' returned the hired man in his thick, rustic tones. "'Didn't need the new barn no how far as room's concerned. Well, I suppose he changed his mind.' He took hold of the horse's bridles. Mrs. Penn went back to the house— Soon the kitchen windows were darkened, and a fragrance like warm honey came into the room. Nanny laid down her work. "'I thought father wanted them to put their hay into the new barn,' she said, wonderingly. "'It's all right,' replied her mother. 
Sammy slid down from the load of hay and came in to see if dinner was ready. "'I ain't going to get a regular dinner today, as long as father's gone,' said his mother. "'I've let the fire go out. You can have some bread and milk and pie. I thought we could get along.' She set out some bowls of milk, some bread and a pie on the kitchen table. "'You'd better eat your dinner now,' said she. "'You might just as well get through with it. I want you to help me afterward.' Nanny and Sammy stared at each other. There was something strange in their mother's manner. Mrs. Penn did not eat anything herself. She went into the pantry, and they heard her moving dishes while they ate. Presently she came out with a pile of plates. She got the clothes-basket out of the shed and packed them in it. Nanny and Sammy watched. She brought out cups and saucers and put them in with the plates. "'What are you going to do, mother?' inquired Nanny in a timid voice. A sense of something unusual made her tremble as if it were a ghost. Sammy rolled his eyes over his pie. "'You'll see what I'm going to do,' replied Mrs. Penn. "'If you're through, Nanny, I want you to go upstairs and pack up your things. And I want you, Sammy, to help me take down the bed in the bedroom.' "'Oh, mother, what for?' gasped Nanny. You'll see. During the next few hours, a feat was performed by this simple, pious New England mother, which was equal in its way to Wolf's storming of the heights of Abraham. It took no more genius and audacity of bravery for Wolf to cheer his wandering soldiers up those steep precipices under the sleeping eyes of the enemy than for Sarah Penn, at the head of her children, to move all their little household goods into the new barn while her husband was away. Nanny and Sammy followed their mother's instructions without a murmur. Indeed, they were overawed. There is a certain uncanny and superhuman quality about all such purely original undertakings as their mother's was to them. Nanny went back and forth with her light loads, and Sammy tugged with sober energy. At five o'clock in the afternoon, the little house in which the Pens had lived for forty years had emptied itself into the new barn. Every builder builds somewhat for unknown purposes, and is in a measure a profit. The architect of Adoniram Penn's barn, while he designed it for the comfort of four-footed animals, had planned better than he knew for the comfort of humans. Sarah Penn saw at a glance its possibilities. Those great box stalls with quilts hung before them would make better bedrooms than the one she had occupied for forty years, and there was a tight carriage room. The harness room, with its chimney and shelves, would make a kitchen of her dreams. The great middle space would make a parlour by and by fit for a palace. Upstairs there was as much room as down. With partitions and windows, what a house would there be? Sarah looked at the row of stanchions before the allotted space for cows, and reflected that she would have her front entry there. At six o'clock the stove was up in the harness-room, the kettle was boiling, and the table set for tea. It looked almost as homelike as the abandoned house across the yard ever had done. The young hired man milked, and Sarah directed him calmly to bring the milk to the new barn. He came gaping, dropping little blots of foam from the brimming pails on the grass. Before the next morning he had spread the story of Adoniram Penn's wife moving into the new barn all over the little village. Men assembled in the store and talked it over. Women with shawls over their heads scuttled into one another's houses before their work was done. Any deviation from the ordinary course of life in this quiet town was enough to stop all progress in it. Everybody paused to look at the staid, independent figure on the side-track. There was a difference of opinion with regard to her. Some held her to be insane, 
some of a lawless and rebellious spirit friday the minister went to see her it was in the forenoon and she was at the barn door shelling peas for dinner she looked up and returned his salutation with dignity then she went on with her work she did not invite him in the saintly expression of her face remained fixed but there was an angry flush over it the minister stood awkwardly before her and talked she handled the peas as if they were bullets at last she looked up and her eyes showed the spirit that her meek front had covered for a lifetime there ain't no use talking mr hersey said she i've thought it all over and over and i believe i'm doing what's right i've made it the subject of prayer and it's betwixt me and the lord and adoniram there ain't no call for nobody else to worry about it well of course if you have brought it to the lord in prayer and feel satisfied that you are doing right mrs penn said the minister helplessly his thin grey-bearded face was pathetic he was a sickly man his youthful confidence had cooled he had to scourge himself up to some of his pastoral duties as relentlessly as a catholic ascetic and then he was prostrated by the smart i think it's right just as much as i think it was right for our forefathers to come over from the old country cause they didn't have what belonged to em said mrs penn she arose the barn threshold might have been plymouth rock from her bearing i don't doubt you mean well mr hersey said she but there are things people hadn't ought to interfere with i've been a member of the church for over forty years i've got my own mind and my own feet and i'm going to think my own thoughts and go my own ways and nobody but the lord is going to dictate to me unless i've a mind to have him won't you come in and set down how is miss hersey she is well i thank you replied the minister he added some more perplexed apologetic remarks then he retreated he could expound the intricacies of every character study in the scriptures he was competent to grasp the pilgrim fathers and all historical innovators but sarah penn was beyond him he could deal with primal cases but parallel ones worsted him but after all although it was aside from his province he wondered more how adoniram penn would deal with his wife than how the lord would everybody shared the wonder when adoniram's four new cows arrived sarah ordered three to be put in the old barn the other in the house shed where the cooking stove had stood that added to the excitement it was whispered that all four cows were domiciled in the house Toward sunset on Saturday, when Adoniram was expected home, there was a knot of men in the road near the new barn. The hired man had milked, but he still hung around the premises. Sarah Penn had supper already. There were brown bread and baked beans and a custard pie. It was the supper that Adoniram loved on a Saturday night. She had on a clean calico, and she bore herself imperturbably nanny and sammy kept close at her heels their eyes were large and nanny was full of nervous tremors still there was to them more pleasant excitement than anything else an inborn confidence in their mother over their father asserted itself sammy looked out of the harness-room window there he is he announced in an awed whisper he and nanny peeped around the casing mrs penn kept on about her work the children watched adoniram leave the new horse standing in the drive while he went to the house door it was fastened then he went around to the shed that door was seldom locked even when the family was away the thought how her father would be confronted by the cow flashed upon nanny there was a hysterical sob in her throat adoniram emerged from the shed and stood looking about in a dazed fashion his lips moved 
he was saying something but they could not hear what it was the hired man was peeping around a corner of the old barn but nobody saw him adoniram took the new horse by the bridle and led him across the yard to the new barn nanny and sammy slunk close to their mother the barn doors rolled back and there stood adoniram with the long mild face of the great canadian farm horse looking over his shoulder nanny kept behind her mother but sammy stepped suddenly forward and stood in front of her adoniram stared at the group what on earth are you all down here for said he what's the matter over to the house we've come here to live father said sammy his shrill voice quavered out bravely what adoniram sniffed what is it smells like cooking said he he stepped forward and looked in the open door of the harness room then he turned to his wife his old bristling face was pale and frightened what on earth does this mean mother he gasped you come in here father said sarah she led the way into the harness room and shut the door now father said she you needn't be scared i ain't crazy there ain't nothing to be upset over but we've come here to live and we're going to live here we've got just as good a right here as new horses and cows the house won't fit for us to live in any longer and i made up my mind i won't go on to stay there i've done my duty by you forty year and i'm going to do it now but i'm going to live here you've got to put in some windows and partitions and you'll have to buy some furniture why mother the old man gasped you'd better take your coat off and get washed there's the wash basin and then we'll have supper why mother sammy went past the window leading the new horse to the old barn the old man saw him and shook his head speechlessly he tried to take off his coat but his arms seemed to lack the power his wife helped him she poured some water into the tin basin and put in a piece of soap she got the comb and brush and smoothed his thin grey hair after he had washed then she put the beans hot bread and tea on the table sammy came in and the family drew up adoniram sat looking dazedly at his plate and they waited ain't you going to ask a blessing father said sarah and the old man bent his head and mumbled all through the meal he stopped eating at intervals and stared furtively at his wife but he ate well the home food tasted good to him and his old frame was too sturdily healthy to be affected by his mind but after supper he went out and sat down on the step of the smaller door at the right of the barn through which he had meant his jerseys to pass in stately file but which sarah designed for her front house door and he leaned his head on his hands after the supper dishes were cleared away and the milk pans washed sarah went out to him the twilight was deepening there was a clear green glow in the sky before them stretched the smooth level of field in the distance was a cluster of haystacks like the huts of a village the air was very cool and calm and sweet the landscape might have been an ideal one of peace sarah bent over and touched her husband on one of his thin sinewy shoulders father the old man's shoulders heaved he was weeping why don't do so father said sarah i'll put up the partitions and everything you want mother sarah put her apron up to her face she was overcome by her own triumph adoniram was like a fortress whose walls had no active resistance 
and went down the instant the right besieging tools were used. "'Why, mother,' he said hoarsely, "'I hadn't no idea you was so set on as all this comes to.' End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Speaking Voice: Principles of Training Simplified and Condensed by Catherine Jewell Everts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Seven: Epic Poetry. The epic poem makes the appeal and demand of essay, lyric poem, and short story in one. If you obey all the laws you have discovered in the study of these first three forms, and use all the power you have developed, you will be able to read effectively this cutting of Gareth and Lynette. This arrangement was made and presented by Mrs. Mary Everts Ewing, formerly teacher of expression in the University of Iowa. Mrs. Ewing's method in cutting a story, poem, or play is simple and very effective, as her results show she says first study your poem play or story as a whole consider it from every standpoint its author its type its motive its philosophy its structure in fact know it second determine your motive in presenting the poem play or story third define your motive what phase of the theme do you want to show? What aspect of the story do you want to present? Which thread of the plot do you wish to follow? Fourth, cut everything which does not preserve the theme, phase, or thread you have chosen to present. Fifth, if your condensation now fails to come within the time allotted for its presentation, cut everything you can without sacrificing your theme sixth if you find you have cut more than is necessary restore that which seems most illuminating to your theme because the arrangement of this one of the idylls of the king has been made for you do not fail to heed the first rule for preparing such a poem for presentation study the complete poem do more study all the idylls of the king saturate yourself in the atmosphere of this great epic read all the fragmentary poems which foreshadow this masterpiece of tennyson's make your own cutting of gareth and lynette and compare it with this one study tennyson's dedication of this epic gareth and lynette the last tall son of Lot and Bellicent, and tallest Gareth, in a showerful spring, stared at the spate. A slender shafted pine lost footing, fell, and so was whirled away. How he went down, said Gareth, as a false knight or evil king before my lance, if lance were mine to use. O oh, senseless cataract, bearing all down in thy precipitancy, and yet thou art but swollen with cold snows, and mine is living blood. Thou dost his will, the makers, and not knowest, and I that know have strength and wit in my good mother's hall linger with vacillating obedience, prisoned and kept and coaxed and whistled to, since the good mother holds me still a child heaven yield her for it but in me put forth to weary her ears with one continuous prayer until she let me fly disgaged to sweep down upon all things base and dash them dead a knight of arthur working out his will and gareth went and hovering round her chair asked mother though ye count me still the child man am i grown a man's work must i do follow the dear follow the christ the king live pure speak true right wrong follow the king to whom the mother said 
yet wilt thou leave thine easeful biding here and risk thine all life limbs for one that is not proven king stay till the cloud that settles round his birth hath lifted but a little stay sweet son and gareth answered quickly not an hour so that ye yield me i will walk through fire mother to gain it your full leave to go who walks through fire will hardly heed the smoke ay go then an ye must only one proof before thou ask the king to make thee knight of thine obedience and thy love to me thy mother i demand and gareth cried a hard one or a hundred so i go nay quick the proof to prove me to the quick but slowly spake the mother looking at him prince thou shalt go disguised to arthur's hall and hire thyself to serve for meats and drinks nor shalt thou tell thy name to any one and thou shalt serve a twelvemonth and a day silent a while was gareth then replied the thrall in person may be free in soul and i shall see the jousts thy son am i and since thou art my mother must obey i therefore yield me freely to thy will so gareth all for glory underwent the sooty yoke of kitchen vassalage ate with young lads his portion by the door and couched at night with grimy kitchen knaves and lancelot ever spake him pleasantly but kay the seneschal who loved him not would hustle and harry him and labour him beyond his comrade of the hearth and set to turn the brooch draw water or hew wood or grosser tasks and gareth bowed himself with all obedience to the king and wrought all kind of service with a noble ease that graced the lowliest act in doing it so for a month he wrought among the thralls but in the weeks that followed the good queen repentant of the word she made him swear and saddening in her childless castle sent arms for her son and loosed him from his vow shame never made girl redder than gareth joy he laughed he sprang whereon he sought the king alone and found and told him all make me thy knight in secret let my name be hidden and give me the first quest i spring like flame from ashes and the king make thee my knight in secret yea but he our noblest brother and our truest man and one with me in all he needs must know let lancelot know my king let lancelot know thy noblest and thy truest so with a kindly hand on gareth's arm smiled the great king and half unwillingly loving his lusty youthhood yielded to him then after summoning lancelot privily i have given him the first quest he is not proven look therefore when he calls for this in hall thou get to horse and follow him far away cover the lions on thy shield and see far as thou mayest he be nor ta'en nor slain then that same day there passed into the hall a damsel of high lineage and cried o king for thou hast driven the foe without see to the foe within why sit ye there rest would i not sir king and i were king till even the lonest hold were all as free from cursed bloodshed as thine altar cloth comfort thyself said arthur i nor mine rest so my knighthood keep the vows they swore the wastest moorland of our realm shall be safe damsel as the centre of this hall what is thy name thy need lynette my name noble my need a knight to combat for my sister leonore's a lady of high lineage of great lands and comely yea and comelier than myself she lives in castle perilous a river runs in three loops about her living place and o'er it are three passings and three knights defend the passings 
brethren and a fourth and of that four the mightiest holds her stayed in her own castle and so besieges her to break her will and make her wed with him and three of these proud in their fantasy call themselves the day morning star and noon sun and evening star the fourth who alway rideth armed in black a huge man-beast of boundless savagery he names himself the night and oftener death and therefore am i come for lancelot hereat sir gareth called from where he rose a head with kindling eyes above the throng a boon sir king this quest and arthur glancing at him brought down a momentary brow rough sudden and pardonable worthy to be knight go therefore and all hearers were amazed but on the damsel's forehead shame pride wrath slew the may white she lifted either arm fie on thee king i asked for thy chief knight and thou hast given me but a kitchen knave then ere a man in hall could stay her turned fled down the lane of access to the king took horse descended the slope street and passed the weird white gate and paused without beside the field of tourney murmuring kitchen knave whereat sir gareth donned the helm and took the shield and mounted horse and grasped a spear of grain storm strengthened on a windy sight and tipped with trenchant steel around him slowly pressed the people and from out of kitchen came the thralls in throng and seeing who had worked lustier than any and whom they could but love mounted in arms threw up their caps and cried god bless the king and all his fellowship and on through lanes of shouting gareth rode down the slope street and passed without the gate but by the field of tourney lingering yet muttered the damsel wherefore did the king scorn me o oh, sweet heaven o oh, fie upon him his kitchen knave to whom sir gareth drew shining in arms damsel the quest is mine lead and i follow she thereat hence avoid thou smellest all of kitchen grease and look who comes behind for there was kay knowest thou not me thy master i am kay we lack thee by the hearth and gareth to him master no more too well i know thee i the most ungentle knight in arthur's hall have at thee then said kay they shocked and kay fell shoulder slipped and gareth cried again lead and i follow and fast away she fled so till the dusk that followed evensong rode on the two reviler and reviled then after one long slope was mounted saw a gloomy gladed hollow and shouts ascended and there brake a serving man flying from out of the black wood and crying they have bound my lord to cast him in the mere then gareth bound am i to right the wronged but straightly abound am i to bide with thee and when the damsel spake contemptuously lead and i follow gareth cried again follow i lead so down among the pines he plunged and there black shadowed nigh the mere saw six tall men hailing a seventh along a stone about his neck to drown him in it three with good blows he quieted but three fled through the pines and gareth loosed the stone from off his neck then in the mere beside tumbled it oilily bubbled up the mere last gareth loosed his bonds and on free feet set him a stalwart baron arthur's friend so when next morn the lord whose life he saved had some brief space conveyed them on their way and left them with god speed sir gareth spake lead and i follow haughtily she replied i fly no more 
I allow thee for an hour, for hard by here is one will overthrow and slay thee. Then will I to court again, and shame the king for only yielding me my champion from the ashes of his hearth. To whom Sir Gareth answered courteously, Say thou thy say, and I will do my deed. Then to the shore of one of those long loops where through the serpent river coiled they came, and there before the lawless warrior paced unarmed, and calling, Damsel, is this he the champion ye have brought from Arthur's hall, for whom we let thee pass? Nay, nay, she said, Sir Morning Star, the king, in utter scorn of thee and thy much folly, hath sent thee here his kitchen knave. And look thou to thyself, see that he fall not on thee suddenly, and slay thee unarmed. He is not knight, but knave. And Gareth silent gazed upon the knight, who stood a moment ere his horse was brought. Then she that watched him, Wherefore stare ye so? Thou shakest in thy fear. There yet is time. Flee down the valley before he get to horse. Who will cry shame? Thou art not knight, but knave. Said Gareth, Damsel, whether knave or knight, Far liefer had I fight a score of times Than hear thee so missay me and revile. Fair words were best for him who fights for thee. But truly, foul are better, For they send that strength of anger through mine arms. I know that I shall overthrow him. And he that bore the star, being mounted, Cried from o'er the bridge, A kitchen knave, and sent in scorn of me, such fight not I, but answer scorn with scorn. Avoid, for it beseemeth not a knave to ride with such a lady. Dog, thou liest, I spring from loftier lineage than thine own, he spake, and all at fiery speed the two shocked on the central bridge, and either knight at once fell as if dead but quickly rose and drew, and Gareth lashed so fiercely with his brand he drave his enemy backward down the bridge, the damsel crying, Well stricken, kitchen knave, till Gareth's shield was cloven, but one stroke laid him that clove it grovelling on the ground. Then cried the fallen, Take not my life, I yield, and Gareth, so this damsel ask it of me, good, I accord it easily as a grace. Thy life is thine at her command. Arise, and quickly pass to Arthur's hall, and say his kitchen knave hath sent thee. See thou crave his pardon for thy breaking of his laws. Myself, when I return, will plead for thee. Thy shield is mine. Farewell, and damsel, thou lead and i follow and fast away she fled then when he came upon her spake methought knave when i watched thee striking on the bridge the savour of thy kitchen came upon me a little faintlier but the wind hath changed i sent it twentyfold and then she sang o oh, morning star that smilest in the blue O oh, star, my morning dream hath proven true, Smile sweetly thou, my love hath smiled on me. But thou be gone, take counsel and away, For hard by here is one that guards afford, The second brother in their fool's parable, Will pay thee all thy wages and to boot. Care not for shame. Thou art not knight, but knave. To whom Sir Gareth answered laughingly, The knave that doth its service as full knight Is all as good, me seems, as any knight Toward thy sister's freeing. Ay, Sir Knave, ay, ay, she said, But thou shalt meet thy match. So when they touched the second river loop, 
huge on a huge red horse and all in mail burnished to blinding shone the noonday sun whom gareth met mid-stream no room was there for lance or tourney skill four strokes they struck with sword and these were mighty the new knight had fear he might be shamed but as the sun heaved up a ponderous arm to strike the fifth the hoof of his horse slipped in the stream the stream descended and the sun was washed away then gareth laid his lance athwart the ford so drew him home but he that fought no more as being all bone battered on the rock yielded and gareth sent him to the king myself when i return will plead for thee lead and i follow quietly she led hath not the good wind damsel changed again nay not a point nor art thou victor here there lies a ridge of slate across the ford his horse thereon stumbled and once again she sang o oh, birds that warble to the morning sky o oh, birds that warble as the day goes by sing sweetly twice my love hath smiled on me there stands the third fool of their allegory for there beyond a bridge of treble bow the knight that named him star of evening stood and gareth wherefore waits the madman there naked in open dayshine nay she cried not naked only wrapped in hardened skins then that other blew a hard and deadly note upon the horn approach and arm me and forthwith they madly hurled together on the bridge and gareth overthrew him lighted drew but up like fire he started and as oft as gareth brought him grovelling on his knees so many a time he vaulted up again till gareth panted hard and his great heart for dooming all his trouble was in vain laboured within him for he seemed as one that all in later sadder age begins to war against ill uses of a life but these from all his life arise and cry thou hast made us lords and canst not put us down he half despairs so gareth seemed to strike vainly the damsel clamouring all the while well done knave knight well stricken o good knight knave shame me not shame me not i have prophesied strike thou art worthy of the table round his arms are old he trusts the hardened skin strike strike the wind will never change again and gareth hearing ever stronglier smote and hewed great pieces of his armour off him but lashed in vain against the hardened skin and could not wholly bring him under more than loud south-westerns rolling ridge on ridge the boy that rides at sea and dips and springs for ever till at length sir gareth's brand clashed his and brake it utterly to the hilt i have thee now but forth that other sprang and all unknightlike writhed his wiry arms around him till he felt despite his mail strangled but straining even his uttermost cast and so hurled him headlong o'er the bridge down to the river sink or swim and cried lead and i follow but the damsel said i lead no longer ride thou at my side thou art the kingliest of all kitchen knaves o oh, trefoil sparkling on the rainy plain o oh, rainbow with three colours after rain shine sweetly thrice my love hath smiled on me sir and good faith i fain had added knight but that i heard thee call thyself a knave shamed am i that i so rebuked reviled missaid thee noble i am and thought the king scorned me and mine and now thy pardon friend damsel he said 
ye be not all to blame saving that ye mistrusted our good king would handle scorn or yield thee asking one not fit to cope thy quest good sooth i hold he scarce is knight who lets his heart be stirred with any foolish heat at any gentle damsel's waywardness shamed care not thy foul sayings fought for me and seeing now thy words are fair methinks there rides no knight not lancelot his great self hath force to quell me look who comes behind for one delayed at first through helping back the dislocated k sir lancelot having swum the river loops his blue shield lions covered softly drew behind the twain and when he saw the star gleam on sir gareth turning to him cried stay felon knight i avenge me for my friend and gareth crying pricked against the cry but when they closed in a moment at one touch of that skilled spear the wonder of the world went sliding down so easily and fell that when he found the grass within his hands he laughed the laughter jarred upon Lynette. Harshly she asked him, Shamed and overthrown and tumbled back into the kitchen, knave, why laugh ye, that ye blew your boast in vain? Nay, noble damsel, but that I, the son of old King Lot and good Queen Bellicent, and victor of the bridges and the ford, and knight of Arthur, here lie thrown, by whom I know not, all through mere unhappiness, device and sorcery and unhappiness out sword we are thrown and lancelot answered prince o gareth through the mere unhappiness of one who came to help thee not to harm lancelot and all as glad to find thee whole as on the day when arthur knighted him o damsel be ye wise to call him shamed who is but overthrown thrown have i been nor once but many a time victor from vanquished issues at the last and overthrower from being overthrown well hast thou done for all the stream is freed and thou hast wreaked his justice on his foes and when reviled hast answered graciously and makest merry when overthrown prince knight hail knight and prince and of our table round and then when turning to lynette he told the tale of gareth petulantly she said i well i well for worse than being fooled of others is to fool one's self a cave sir lancelot is hard by with meats and drinks and forage for the horse and flint for fire but all about it flies a honeysuckle seek till we find and when they sought and found sir gareth drank and ate and all his life passed into sleep on whom the maiden gazed sound sleep be thine sound cause to sleep hast thou o oh, lancelot lancelot and she clapped her hands full merry am i to find my goodly knave is knight and noble see now sworn have i else yon black felon had not let me pass to bring thee back to do the battle with him thus an thou goest he will fight thee first who doubts thee victor so will my knight knave miss the full flower of this accomplishment said lancelot peradventure he ye name may know my shield let gareth an he will change his for mine and take my charger fresh not to be spurred loving the battle as well as he that rides him lancelot like she said courteous in this lord lancelot as in all and gareth wakening fiercely clutched the shield ramp ye lance splintering lions on whom all spears are rotten sticks ye seem agape to roar yea ramp and roar at leaving of your lord 
care not good beasts so well i care for you o oh, noble lancelot from my hold on these streams virtue fire through one that will not shame even the shadow of lancelot under shield hence let us go silent the silent field they traversed suddenly she that rode upon his left clung to the shield that lancelot lent him crying yield yield him this again tis he must fight miracles ye cannot here is glory enow in having flung the three i see thee maimed mangled i swear thou canst not fling the fourth then for a space and under cloud that grew to thunder gloom palling all stars they rode in converse till she made her palfrey halt lifted an arm and softly whispered there and all the three were silent seeing pitched beside the castle perilous on flat field a huge pavilion like a mountain peak sunder the glooming crimson on the marge black with black banner and a long black horn beside it hanging which sir gareth grasped and so before the two could hinder him sent all his heart and breath through all the horn echoed the wall a light twinkled anon came lights and lights and once again he blew whereon were hollow tramplings up and down and muffled voices heard and shadows passed till high above him circled with her maids the lady leonore's at a window stood beautiful among lights and waving to him white hands and courtesy but when the prince three times had blown after long hush at last the huge pavilion slowly yielded up through those black foldings that which housed therein high on a night-black horse in night-black arms with white breastbone and barren ribs of death and crowned with fleshless laughter some ten steps in the half-light through the dim dawn advanced the monster and then paused and spake no word but gareth spake and all indignantly fool for thou hast men say the strength of ten canst thou not trust the limbs thy god hath given but must to make the terror of thee more trick thyself out in ghastly imageries of that which life hath done with and the clod less dull than thou will hide with mantling flowers as if for pity but he spake no word which set the horror higher a maiden swooned the lady leonore's wrung her hands and wept as doomed to be the bride of night and death sir gareth's head prickled beneath his helm and even sir lancelot through his warm blood felt ice strike and all that marked him were aghast at once sir lancelot's charger fiercely neighed at once the black horse bounded forward with him then those that did not blink the terror saw that death was cast to ground and slowly rose but with one stroke sir gareth split the skull half fell to right and half to left and lay then with a stronger buffet he clove the helm as thoroughly as the skull and out from this issued the bright face of a blooming boy fresh as a flower new-born and crying knight slay me not my three brethren bade me do it to make a horror all about the house and stay the world from lady leonore's they never dreamed the passes would be passed answered sir gareth graciously to one not many a moon his younger my fair child what madness made thee challenge the chief knight of arthur's hall fair sir they bade me do it they hate the king and lancelot the king's friend 
they hoped to slay him somewhere on the stream they never dreamed the passes could be passed then sprang the happier day from underground and lady leonore's and her house with dance and revel and song made merry over death as being after all their foolish fears and horrors only proven a blooming boy so large mirth lived and gareth won the quest and he that told the tale in older times says that sir gareth wedded leonore's but he that told it later says lynette alfred tennyson end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Speaking Voice: Principles of Training Simplified and Condensed by Catherine Jewell Everts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Dramatic Monologue and the Play. Our study in the vocal interpretation of literary forms finally reaches the play. The natural approach to the play is through the dramatic monologue indeed the play when presented by one person becomes a dramatic monologue the dictionary in defining the monologue authorizes three forms one when the actor tells a continuous story in which he is the chief character referring to the others as absent two when he assumes the voice or manner of several characters successively three more recently when he implies that the others are present leading the audience to imagine what they say by his replies browning created this more recent form which is the most vital of the three i have chosen for your study of the monologue examples from browning alone to interpret effectively any one of the browning monologues will call into play every element of power in voice and expression which you have gained in your study of previous forms you must think vividly feel intelligently realize and suggest an atmosphere sustain a situation and keep the beauty of the poetic form and you must do all this in the person of another the new demand which the monologue makes is impersonation let us see just what we mean by impersonation it is the art of identifying one's self with the character to be portrayed it is the art of losing one's self in the character and the situation the dramatist has created this means that the spirit of the character must take possession of the impersonator and inform his every thought and feeling and so his every motion and tone remember it is the spirit of the character that must determine the nature of the tone and gesture the great danger in entering upon the study of impersonation lies in emphasizing the outward manifestation instead of the inward spirit of the character to be portrayed if you really sense the soul mind heart quality of the character you are to present and have made your voice and body free agents for the manifestation of those qualities your impersonation will be convincing if the spirit of the patriot or andrea dal sarto or fra lippo lippi or pompilia or caponsacchi or guido obsesses you the outward manifestation will take care of itself always provided your instruments are responsive don't begin with the outward manifestation don't say i think this man would frown a great deal or fold his arms over his breast or use an eyeglass or strut or stoop or do any one of a hundred things which if repeated a half dozen times during an impersonation may become a mannerism and get between the audience and the spirit of the character when you are studying a character for the purpose of impersonation determine first to what type it belongs 
then study that type wherever you are daily life becomes your teacher and studio when you enter upon this art there are no longer dull moments in railroad stations or trains in shops or in the social whirl everywhere and always you are the student seeking to know and understand types of people better that you may use your knowledge in presenting to an audience an individual when you have caught the spirit of the individual you must realize the situation out of which this particular individual speaks let us make a special study of the tale browning's epilogue to the two poets of croisic it is perhaps the most exquisite of the poet's creations in this field the situation reveals a young girl recalling to her poet lover an old greek tale he had once told her there is a suggestion from some critics that browning has drawn his wife in this portrait and through it pays his tribute to her this immediately affords us a clue to the type of character to which the speaker belongs we cannot hope nor do we wish to impersonate mrs browning but a knowledge of mrs browning and her relation to her poet lover gained through a study of her letters and sonnets will lead us more quickly to a comprehension of the speaker and situation in the tale obsessed by the spirit of the character and fully realizing the situation our next step is in imagination to set the stage this is an important point in presenting a monologue the impersonator must have a clear idea of his position on his imaginary stage relative to his imaginary interlocutor but he must remember that imaginary stage setting admits of only delicately suggestive use this is true of the handling of a monologue at every point it must be suggestive the actor carries to completion the action which the monologist suggests the art of interpreting a monologue depends upon the discrimination of the impersonator in drawing his line between suggestion and actualization in gesture the business of the monologist is to make an appeal to the imagination of the audience so vivid that the imagination of the audience can actualize the suggestion and the illusion is complete what are the relative positions of the girl and her lover in the tale there is nothing in the lines to make our choice arbitrary it is only important that we determine a relation and keep it consistently throughout the reading here is a possible setting they are in the poet's study he is working at his desk she is sitting in a great chair before the fire a book in her hand which she does not read she is gazing into the flames she begins dreamily more to herself than to him what a pretty tale you told me at what point does her tone lose its reflective quality and become more personal where does she turn to him how do we know that he leaves his chair and comes over to sit on the arm of her chair what calls him to her what two qualities of feeling run through her mood and determine the colour of her tone and the character of her movements if your study of mrs browning has been intelligent this interplay of the whimsical and serious in her nature cannot have escaped you and it will illumine now your impersonation of this girl it is the secret of the peculiar charm of this creation the story she tells is an old and well-known one it is the manner of the telling through which we come in touch with an exquisite woman's soul that holds us spellbound unless the interpreter catches this secret and reveals it to his audience he will miss the distinctive feature of the monologue and reduce it to a narrative poem a tale 
what a pretty tale you told me once upon a time said you found it somewhere scold me was it prose or was it rhyme greek or latin greek you said while your shoulder propped my head anyhow there's no forgetting this much if no more that a poet pray no petting yes a bard sir famed of yore went where such like used to go singing for a prize you know well he had to sing nor merely sing but play the lyre playing was important clearly quite as singing i desire sir you keep the fact in mind for a purpose that's behind there stood he while deep attention held the judges round judges able i should mention to detect the slightest sound sung or played amiss such ears had old judges it appears none the less he sang out boldly played in time and tune till the judges weighing coldly each note's worth seemed late or soon sure to smile in vain one tries picking faults out take the prize when a mischief were there seven strings the lyre possessed oh and afterward eleven thank you well sir who had guessed such ill luck in store it happed one of those same seven strings snapped all was lost then no a cricket what cicada pooh some mad thing that left its thicket for mere love of music flew with its little heart on fire lighted on the crippled lyre so that when our joy our singer for his truant string feels with disconcerted finger what does cricket else but fling fiery heart forth sound the note wanted by the throbbing throat ay and ever to the ending cricket chirps at need executes the hands intending prompt perfectly indeed saves the singer from defeat with her chirrup low and sweet till at ending all the judges cry with one assent take the prize a prize who grudges such a voice and instrument why we took your lyre for harp so it shrilled us forth f sharp did the conqueror spurn the creature once its service done that's no such uncommon feature in the case when music's son finds his lotty's power too spent for aiding soul development no this other on returning homeward prize in hand satisfied his bosom's yearning sir i hope you understand said some record there must be of this cricket's help to me so he made himself a statue marble stood life-size on the lyre he pointed at you perched his partner in the prize never more apart you found her he throned from him she crowned that's the tale its application somebody i know hopes one day for reputation through his poetry that's oh all so learned and so wise and deserving of a prize if he gains one will some ticket when his statue's built tell the gazer twas a cricket helped my crippled lyre whose lilt sweet and low when strength usurped softness place in a scale she chirped for as victory was nighest while i sang and played with my lyre at lowest highest right alike one string that made love sound soft was snapped in twain never to be heard again had not a kind cricket fluttered perched upon the place vacant left and duly uttered love 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 when e'er the bass asked the treble to atone for its somewhat sombre drone but you don't know music wherefore keep on casting pearls to a poet all i care for is 
to tell him that a girl's love comes aptly in when gruff grows his singing there enough incident of the french camp you know we french stormed ratibon a mile or so away on a little mound napoleon stood on our storming day with neck out thrust you fancy how legs wide arms locked behind as if to balance the prone brow oppressive with its mind just as perhaps he mused my plans that soar to earth may fall let once my army leader land waver at yonder wall out twixt the battery smokes there flew a rider bound on bound full galloping nor bridle drew until he reached the mound then off there flung in smiling joy and held himself erect by just his horse's mane a boy you hardly could suspect so tight he kept his lips compressed scarce any blood came through you looked twice ere you saw his breast was all but shot in two well cried he emperor by god's grace we've got you ratibon the marshal's in the market-place and you'll be there anon to see your flag-bird flap his vans where i to heart's desire perched him the chief's eye flashed his plans soared up again like fire the chief's eye flashed but presently softened itself as sheathes a film the mother eagle's eye when her bruised eaglet breathes you're wounded nay the soldier's pride touched to the quick he said i'm killed sire and his chief beside smiling the boy fell dead my last duchess ferrara that's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive i call that piece a wonder now for our pandolf's hands worked bitterly a day and there she stands wilt please you sit and look at her i said fra pandolf by design for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance but to myself they turned since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there so not the first are you to turn and ask thus sir twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess cheek perhaps fra pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed she liked whate'er she looked on and her looks went everywhere sir twas all one my favour at her breast the dropping of the daylight in the west the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode with round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least she thanked men good but thanked somehow i know not how as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be lessened so nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse in then would be some stooping and i choose never to stoop 
oh sir she smiled no doubt whene'er i passed her but who passed without much the same smile this grew i gave commands then all smiles stopped together there she stands as if alive wilt please you rise we'll meet the company below then i repeat the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry will be disallowed though his fair daughter's self as i avowed at starting is my object nay we'll go together dancer notice neptune though taming a sea-horse thought a rarity which class of innsbruck cast in bronze for me robert browning our last form for interpretative vocal study is the play we shall discover that the presentation of the play makes the same demands upon the interpreter as the monologue with the new element of transition we are still studying the monologue because we are to read not act the play it is still suggestive not actualized impersonation but instead of one character to suggestively set forth we have two three a dozen to present the transition from character to character becomes our one new problem as we have said before in making the transition from character to character voice mind and body must be so volatile that the action of the play shall not be interrupted i know of no better way to enter upon the study of a play for reading or acting than to treat each character as the speaker in a monologue of the browning type the danger in transition from character to character centres in the instant's pause when one speaker yields to another the unskilful reader loses both characters at this point and becomes conscious of himself the action of the play stops and the illusion of scene and situation is lost the great reader of the play in that instant's pause as he utters the last word of one character becomes the interlocutor listening to the words which he as the other character has just uttered in that instant he must show the effect of the speech he has just uttered upon the character he has just become which is the greater art to read a play or to act in it use for your study of the play the shakespearean drama begin with scenes from as you like it and the merchant of venice End of chapter 8 End of The Speaking Voice Principles of Training Simplified and Condensed by Catherine Jewell Everts Recording by Ruth Golding, February 2012